Uh, Mary Sheehan Bugard from the Development Disabilities Council has been absolutely integral in helping us um, determine what topics would be best, as well as getting us all our speakers and helping us at each of these months training. And then also Kimberly Hoga from Detroit Wayne Integrated Health Network, who is uh, promoting this amongst her colleagues and school personnel and folks throughout the Wayne County area. So the more uh, that we could have involved in this conversation, the happier we are. So we really do appreciate that. And let's go to the next slide. All right, so we have just a little bit of housekeeping here. Um, so this session has been approved for a social work CEU. In order to receive that CEU, you will need to complete the evaluation at the end um, of our webinar today that I will link in the chat. Um, and even if you're not looking for CEUs, um, we appreciate if you fill out the evaluation. That is how we improve our trainings for the future. Um, and so for questions, comments, there is a raise your hand feature. So if you look at the top of your team's um, bar, there's a little smiley face with a hand there. So there you can raise your hand. You can also put your question in the chat and we will be monitoring that. Um, and I believe our presenter said that they're, you know, kind of open to the flow of questions. Um, so we'll be um, bringing those questions up as they come. And then I also wanted to let everyone know that this training is being recorded today um, and it will be posted on our website for later viewing, um, as well as our previous sessions um, are available for viewing on our website. And I will link that in the chat um, so you guys have that to see. And that wraps up my housekeeping. Thanks, Caitlin. So I, I thanked our partners. So I'm, let's go to the next slide. So today we're going to be talking about supported decision making and person centered planning. And um, we have three individuals that are going to be presenting today and I'll let them, you know, give their credentials and say why they're experts on this topic. But I'm excited about I've, I love person centered planning. You know, when you've been in the public mental health system a long time, you've experienced lots of things. So believe it or not, I was around in 1996 when it actually became law, you know, uh, but when something is law, then people think, OK, we just have to follow it. But person center planning is such a great tool. It's just a fabulous way to to talk about and plan and support people in their lives. I've I've used, you know, if you want to say a, a version of person center planning, when my own children who do not have disabilities was turning 18 and transitioning to adult life. It's like, OK, we sat down, we had a conversation. What, what are you going to do? Who's going to support you to do that? How are you going to do this? How are you going to do that? You know, we didn't necessarily document it, but it was a very similar process. It is just a wonderful tool. I've got a lot of passion about person center planning, so I'm really excited that we're going to be talking about this today. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our presenters and they can uh, give some background about themselves. Thank you. I guess we'll go in order of the how we are listed on the screen. I'm Jan Lampman um, and I um, currently work as a consultant with an organization, a little company called Community Drive. Um, and Community Drive is really all about um, supporting all citizens to be a part of their community in whatever way that they choose to be. And person centered planning is really um, a very important um, tool that we can use to help people do that, right? Uh, my my background actually in, let's see, what year was it? 1985, I went to work in a group home that was for people who were coming out of institutions. So my career started pre, before person-centered planning, um, working with folks that were coming out of institutions. And, um, you know, I grew along with the people that I was serving and eventually got to, got the privilege of working at the Arc of Midland starting in um, 1993. And so was introduced to person-centered planning and facilitating person-centered planning through that employment. And um, much like Vicki have a strong passion for the power of the process when done well. Um, it really can be transformative, not only for individuals, but really for communities and systems. And so um, it's definitely a great, um, something you can do if you're doing it right, it can eliminate the need for guardianship. Hi everyone, I'm Angela Martin and I work at the Michigan Developmental Disabilities Institute. Um, we're a statewide organization that happens to be based at Wayne State, but we serve the entire state. 
um, and happy to join with with Jan and 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 thank um, colleagues on the supported decision making group um, both at statewide that we've been working together to try to really advance supported decision making but then also um, so grateful that uh, I live in Oakland County and um, I have a family member uh, who receives supports from Oakland Community Health Network so I'm really grateful that my local CMH is um, so supportive of encouraging uh, people to have decision making in their life and using supported um, with quality person center planning. So grateful to be here and I'll look forward to hearing your thoughts as we discuss today. And I think I will hand it over to to Amy then and, and let her introduce herself. Did Amy get on the call? Amy, she did. I see her right there. Oh, there you are. Oops, Amy, I think you're on mute. You might have to unmute yourself. I see your lips moving, but I don't hear you. Amy, it says you're not on mute, but we don't hear your sound at all. Um, I would maybe try leaving and rejoining, mm. um, or maybe you can call in. Yeah, try try to reconnect, and then um, once uh, you you come to your part, you can introduce yourself at that point. Okay, that that would work. Yep. Okay. So Great. Let's, let's go to the next slide. So uh, we thought we would start with a short video to kind of lay the the groundwork for our um, our discussion today, um, and share um, the example of somebody who happens to live in Oakland County. Um, and share how he is using person center planning to really support his uh, personal uh, plans for his future and, and using supported decision making um, principles and activities to to honor that. So um, it's just a, a few minutes and, and we'll um, hear from Alex. So I'll, I'll pass it to Caitlin to start us off. I am Alex Kimmel, the self determinator. I don't think we were ever really looking for a cure, you know, because Alex is Alex is Alex. But there certainly were some aspects of his life that sure seemed like if we could figure out how to make this thing easier, life would be easier. He's someone who helps educate, inspire about the possibilities that people can have if, if given some opportunity to make some of those decisions. When we're going to work, we go stop at the gas station. He usually has a water and some chips. From there on, it's about a 20 minute drive. That's usually the time that I like to spend with Alex just to catch up. How was your previous day? What activities were you up and about? How did everything go? He arrives in the morning and he knows the tasks that he has to accomplish here. He is self-motivated and self-driven. He takes those tasks on all on his own, which primarily include running a powered sweeper through the warehouse to clean up dust and spills. He manages our damaged bags by scanning the UPC codes on those damages, and then we run them through our computer system to relieve inventory. It's a wonderful relationship. People want to feel safe and they want to feel valued. Everything else kind of comes second. And what he's hoping becomes his full-time gig is he owns a business called The Self-Determinator. And as The Self-Determinator, he gets hired by universities or different entities within community mental health to do presentations. My career is dedicated to helping others know of the power of self-determination. I could be spending the better part of a day training and Alex will walk in and spend 20 minutes doing his presentation and the impact is more significant because of, you know, just who Alex is and what he's presenting and, and the message he's sharing. Alex takes his person-centered planning quite seriously and he puts some very specific goals in his person-centered plan. But Alex said, hey, I want to be physically fit. So boom, there comes your, at this point, it's Anytime Fitness and Softball and Bocce Ball, Walking Buddy twice a day. Another goal in his person-centered plan was, you know, I want to have friends. I want to be interacting with people. So I guess the drive is from him. It's what he put into his person-centered plan and then that gives us our marching orders of, okay, this is what we need to be working on. Well, Alex came into the choir this year and he really has a very nice voice and he contributes quite a bit to the men's section choir. He works hard at rehearsals. In fact, you can see it on his face. And when there's a good part that he really likes, 
Well, you know he really likes it. He's also in the Clarkston Community Band. He plays clarinet. We've been doing that on and off since 2011, I think. He's busy. You know, he's doing so much. And I think what drives him is based on his desire to help and get this message out. I remember him telling me that he believes that he is blessed to be called a person with autism because he thought that there were those in the autism community who needed to hear what he had to say. My purpose is to build safe, loving relationships where all feel valued. He's got it. He understands what it is that we all need, and he's trying to help others understand it. It's just life. And I think one of the gifts of Alex has been our whole life slowed down, and I think it's benefited the entire family. We slow down and we celebrate things. We joke around sometimes saying the slower you go, the quicker you get there. And that's what Alex is referring to. If you slow down, the quicker you'll be able to understand where it is that I'm coming from, and therefore you'll be able to support me. Don't put limits on your dreams or the dreams of others. Don't put limits on your potential or the potential of others. That's what we can learn from Alex. So we can get, yep, there we go. So um, Amy, are you with, are you able to, can we hear you? Yes, yes I am. Yay, thank you Amy. So Amy, why don't yes. you start? Why don't can you, you hear me? We can hear you. So why don't okay. you start, okay. So why don't you start by um, telling everyone who you are, where you work, what you do. Um, can you start with that? I am Amy Kupovitz. I am a rights educator proudly and a peer mentor. And where do you live? I live in Wild Lake. In Wild Lake. So that's um Western, right? Western Oakland? Western. Western yeah. of Oakland. West of Oakland. The oh. west side of Oakland County. Okay. So um the way that we're gonna sort of do this is I'm gonna ask Amy questions about um kind of a little bit about her life so that you can get an idea of what her life is like and then about how person-centered planning um, helps her. So Amy, let's start with, can we start with you sort of sharing what like you, you lived with your mom, right? I lived with mom and then when she died, I had to make the toughest decision of my life to go into a group home at first. Uh, my neighbor who had a who has a handy with a disabled daughter said to me, No, you won't have to go into a nursing home because I thought I would. And she said, No, you're going into more with uh, trust me and <laughs> you'll get an apartment with a roommate. And then I, I couldn't find a roommate, so I had to go into a group home. Are you in a group home currently? No, I'm in my own apartment. Right. So how did you get from a group home to your own apartment? Well, I, after mom died, I had a lot of help from Wall Lake. And, and the fire chief helped me get into a townhouse at first with with the roommate but the roommate didn't work out so i went into a senior citizen low-cost housing so i could have my own apartment and my own staff okay so who and you said that the fire chief helped you because he yeah. was a friend of your family, right? For a long yes. time? Yes. Yes. So now you also have had like a public guardian or conservator, right? Right now, 
I am a conservator. I used to have a guardian, but they found out I was smarter than I, I how smart I was. So they changed it to a conservator. I went back to court, and as soon as the judge looked at me and heard what I was doing, because I, at that time I was an Avon lady, and he looked at me and he said, uh, you don't need a guardian, you just need a conservator. Okay, okay. So you have person-centered plans, right? Yes. And so um, is would you say that um, that person-centered planning, using that process with your friend, the fire chief, being part of it, that that is sort of how you kind of have been able to get the support you need to do the things you want to do? Yes, um, person center planning has helped me in many ways. Okay, can you talk about that? Yeah. Some of my friends didn't believe I could do what I could do, and it has helped me prove to them that I could <laughs> do it. And I, I have a job now, and so that helped me with with that too. Right, right. So I don't want to. We we're not going to like trash guardians or anything like that um, no. because you know, that's not our job. But no. but one of the things you did say to me, Amy, is that really the fire chief often is the one that helps you with things you need help with because your guardian or your conservator doesn't really know you. Is that would you say that's accurate? I just got a new conservator and they don't even know what I can do. So yes, the fire chief has helped me explain to them what I could do and let me explain to them what I could do. So, so really, even having that conservator, having the fire chief and having your person-centered plan so that you can use those right to help your guard your conservator understand what it is you're doing and what you need them to help you with right has been beneficial yeah. yeah and i think you need a van right i have a van okay uh, a mini van, but i'd like to save for another van so i can continue with my job and going to church Okay, and so are there some goals in your person center plan that are kind of like related to that so that you can stay focused on? Yeah, so what yeah. can you share a little bit about what the goals in your plan are that are helping you get to that? I would like to save uh, right now, I'm saving $100 a month for the new van, and I would eventually like to. to set up an able account for for the new van right perfect okay um all right well thank you for telling that little bit of your story and as we go through the slides um then i'm going to have some other questions for you okay will okay. do all right next slide please so you know some of the some of the um things that people worry about. And some of this is going to be a review for those of you who've been a part of the whole series, but like things, you know, concerns that families have or family friends have, like as in Amy's case, right? Education, safety, medical decisions, finances, communication, sexuality, legal kinds of issues. You know, those are the things that make people think you need a guardian. Um, in fact, Amy, you mentioned that some people in your, in your circle, when your mom passed away at first, thought you needed a guardian, right? Yes, they did. And they so, didn't know what I could do, even though I went to OCC for two years. They they still couldn't believe I could be that <clears throat> be that intelligent. So what were some of the things they were, were like when I mentioned safety, medical, finances, what were some of the things that your circle members were afraid you would need help with and thought me thought it meant you needed a guardian? 
Everything. Everything? Okay. Okay. Everything. Sure. All they, right. They knew I I was talking to but they didn't know how it, um, high functioning I was or that I could even how should I say this? Um, make a decision for myself. Okay. Well, when you do need some help and advocacy, um, who do you usually call? <laughs> the fire chief. The fire chief. Fire chief. <laughs> I just fire chief. Need fire chief. <laughs> fire chief. Yeah, right? Yes. Yeah. So when you've had situations come up that you did need help with, you just called a friend, right? A very close friend. Yep. Which is what everybody does. I mean, I'm sure you talk to your friends about things that you have a make a decision about, don't you? Absolutely. Amy? Yep. Absolutely, Amy. That is very true. Okay, next slide. So, uh, you know, I just, I can, I like to beat a dead horse. And so I'm going to beat this statistic into people's brains, even though you've probably heard it a million times. You know, there's just too much guardianship. And when we see that nationally, there are 43% of the population of people with developmental disabilities who have a guardian, I think that's a big number. But then I look at Michigan's number and it's, you know, as of 2018, which is just a few years ago, 81% of citizens with developmental disabilities in Michigan have a guardian. And Amy was one of those people until suddenly the judge realized she didn't need it, right? So we yeah. know there's too many unnecessarily guardianships. Next slide. So some of the things that, you know, that could be in jeopardy in terms of rights when you have guardianship are things like deciding where to live, um, consenting to or preventing medical and health kinds of issues, determining how and when to travel, how you spend your money, making changes in your in where you work or where you go to school, um, you know, signing a contract, buying a house, um, even simple things like giving permission to have your picture taken and shown publicly, right? But if we listened to Amy's story, she addressed a lot of those issues through person-centered planning, right, Amy? Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, who helped you? F who was it? Who did you say again helped you with this apartment thing? Fire chief. <laughs> the fire chief. That's right. Everybody needs a fire chief in their life for sure. Um, right. So, I mean, really and truly through person center planning and the people that are a part of your plan, you have addressed every one of those issues. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Go to the next slide, please. So then we're going to talk about supported decision making, which is what Amy said, right? She said, did she ask me that question? Don't you ask your friends for help when you need help or advice? And that's really what supported decision making is, right? It's living your life and making decisions about your life in the way that everyone else does, whether you have a disability or not. Okay, next slide. So then I also just wanted to highlight what's what when we talk about supported decision making, right, we're talking about people making decisions on their own and having great things like person centered planning or a fire chief in their lives to help them make those decisions. But when we're talking about guardianship, we're talking about substitute decision making, which means that someone else is making those decisions. Someone else has the legal right and the legal responsibility to make those decisions. Next slide. So, you know, getting started with some kind of supported decision making is, you know, really the steps are you start a conversation, you identify who's willing and able to assist. I think by now we all know that the fire chief in Walled Lake would be a really good person. <laughs> so you can't know. believe me, he's got a lot of work and he, he's really taken. He's, he's made. You, guys are, you guys are good friends. Plan, you, you plan, you communicate, you set up some kind of agreements and you just let everybody know what you're what you're doing, right? Which is really something that person-centered planning can help us to do. So next slide. Um, circles of support are a really um, key part of a planning team. 
And we're going to talk more next month about circles of support. But I just wanted to make sure that that we did mention that that's people, friends, family, coworkers, fire chiefs, you know, whoever you have in your life um, that can be a part of your circle to help you succeed. And those are the people you would also invite to the table for person centered planning. Next slide. OK, so Angela, you want to start take take over? Am I unmuted now? Just want to make sure. Yep, OK, very good. Thank you. So as, as Jan said, um, when we talk about uh, person centered planning, it's it's about helping people um, to make. Um, to build on their strengths and, and their and their uh, honoring their choices and preferences. Um, person centered planning is about one person at a time, and I think it's really important that um, we have uh, a plan that reflects who the person is. So that experience for each person, and if you've been to, if you've worked in the field, as, as Vicki said for a while, and you've been to a lot of person center plans, and they all start to look the same, then it's not really person center planning. It's, it's kind of a really easy check if we're doing good quality person center planning. Um, and in Michigan, we're really unique in that we have a state um, law that governs that says person centered planning is for all people that receive behavioral health supports. And when we say behavioral health supports, that's supports that are delivered by community mental health for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, people with mental health disabilities, and people with substance use disorders. So all people that receive services and supports from, from the community mental health system are expected to have a planning process and um, that reflects their individual needs and strengths. Uh, next Angela, slide. we have yes. a quick question. Someone has their hand raised. OK, we'll ask that person to just unmute and ask the question. Thanks, Mary. Janet, did you have a question? Hey. Oh. OK, the hand's gone down. They may have you may have uh, and answered the question. OK, yeah, maybe and, and feel free if, if 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 it comes back up and don't hesitate. We, we we love the questions, so we'll go to the next slide. Again, you can either raise your hand or you can write the question or type the question into the chat box. Great. So um, as Jan said, we are we're not here to bash guardians um, because some some guardians are providing a really solid support to people that that um, might might choose to have that involved in that relationship in their life. Um, but what we do know is that even the guardianship association, and that's kind of like the the group of people that are guardians who um, collectively work together to make sure that if guardianship is working for people, we got to make it work to the very best. Their association has even said that so supported decision making should be considered before guardianship. So those are even guardians saying, whoa, 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 before we go to the extreme of assigning um, somebody a guardian, we really need to make sure that supported decision making is the first step. And um, also recognizing that even if a guardian is present, that it's supported decision, decision making is still part of that guardianship relationship or that support of guardianship. So, um, it's not to, uh, you know, to get rid of one and only have the other. That's not what what even the guardians themselves believe is the right approach. They do believe that supported decision making should be a part of it all. Next slide. So guardians should um, only be utilized and used when it's necessary to to make sure that a person has um, to protect the well-being of a person. Um, even when that happens, even the law says in Michigan is that it needs to be designed in a way that maximizes the person's self-reliance. So the person is relying on their decisions to and, and themselves and making sure that the person is autonomous. And what that means is that the person is making decisions that they're still considered an independent person and in, in making decisions about their life and their individual needs. Next slide. So before we think about guardianship, we need to ask, why should we do that? Are there other options to consider that are less restrictive and intrusive, meaning that they don't get in your business as much as they need to? And um, how do we uh, try out those alternate, um, those alternatives to guardianship and make sure that they're sufficient, meaning that they meet the person's needs? Um, 
and then also why would um, you know, what we expect we need to make sure we're asking the question that what we expect the issue to be resolved is it really going to be addressed through guardianship um, and so sometimes as, as Jan even said that that sometimes people think that they're fixing something by assigning a guardian and that might not be the case so we have to be really careful and think about that so Amy, I'm gonna. Can I ask you a quick question? Yes. So when 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 you were talking with Jan about your experience, and you said that people in your life thought you needed help with pretty much everything, um, when they asked you, when you were thinking about some ways to change that, so you didn't have a guardian anymore. What were the things that you talked about that you would fit that were were fixed by just having people in your life help you, maybe through a conservator. Was money something that you needed really specific help with? Um, I've taken over two of my bills myself, and they can't believe that I can do it every month, pay them every month. And that's so. that's that's great, Amy. And I think the other thing that I was that's I think I want to take note of and, and, and make sure you said earlier that not only you take you just said that you're taking care of your bills, which is the first part of good money management, right? But you're also saving and you even have a sp very specific target. There's a lot of hundred bucks a month. That's a that's a good specific goal to have exactly how much to save. I told my conservator just take a hundred out of my gives me 264 for my expenses that doesn't even cover it but he still gives it to me and i just told him to take 100 out of that and just save it as i said someday i'd like to get an able account but he doesn't even know what it is i mean that's perfect well, Amy, and I think it's really uh, important. I, there's a lot of people that I know and that I've known that are not really good savers. They're sometimes spenders and they're not good savers. And to be good, responsible about paying your bills on time and then also being a good saver, that's a really important thing. So sometimes people think having a guardian can solve, can create a safety net. Um, but with good supports and and, and um, opportunities um, that we can provide support to persons so that they're having the things that our worries are addressed with other alternatives. Angela, Next. we have a comment from the chat you might want to address. Liz okay. Bauer writes, Michigan law allows for partial guardianships wherein only specific powers are given to the guardian. Judges dislike this as it's more work but it can provide for specific needs without taking all decision making power from the individual receiving the services. Absolutely. And Liz, um, Liz has been working for maintaining folks rights for a very long time, and this is a very specific situation that we continue to see that has not changed over time is that that the judges tend to just go with the full guardianship because it's kind of easier to manage when in fact um, it's more about just kind of process and paperwork and it doesn't really speak to the to the specific needs of the person and we you know trying to think about those partial guardianships and and really specific and I think the other important piece is that people need to also people that the guardianship has been assigned to need to also be really aware about what is specifically included in their partial guardianship because some people think some people don't know all the details and it's really important upon about uh, people supporting them to make sure we are having them be aware of that. So excellent point, Liz, and thank you. So I think we'll go to the next slide and we're going to talk a little bit about how person center planning. So um, Jan mentioned that, you know, we've made lots of changes in, in over time in, in Michigan specifically and in the disability field. Um, and using person center planning to help people get the lives that they want. So we used to have a really traditional you know, model of service where we had people in state institutions and large, large group settings, and we slowly moved into more individualized or community-based supports. Um, but with that, we are even more, uh, we're moving along that 
road a little bit farther along where people are um, directing their supports and also delivering it uh, peer to peer support. So those are ways that we're helping people. Uh, what we're doing better is a society and community to make sure that people are getting the lives that they want, not just getting supported through services. Next slide. So when we think about person centered planning and how it helps to plan for the future, it's really important again just to reiterate. Um, you know, it should be about one person at a time and it needs to be individualized, so it's person specific. It needs to be, be, be building on what's what is good for that person and what's their potential success. Um, gathering together uh, a, a group of people that are committed to that person and Jan mentioned a uh, circle support, which I know is the next topic in the series and um, having those people um, come together so that the person is believed in, supported and working together at, all in a common goal towards the outcomes that are outlined by the person. And so we have to help people think about um, sometimes folks don't come with a lot of people in their team, so to speak. Um, they're, you know, your your peeps, the people that you, you, you turn to for advice and support. Sometimes we have to also use person centered planning to help them develop that. Um, some people have in their life maybe had family fall away for a variety of reasons. Um, sometimes people have not um, been able to maintain really positive relationships, so it's helping them use person center planning to think about how we can help develop that network. And the other important thing is we also have to be respectful through person center planning of a person's individual culture and their family culture. So it's about that person and all the pieces that um, are helping them plan for their future and being very specific to their needs and what their goals are. Next slide. So when we think about person center planning and Caitlin, you can just um, hit the button and then I'll pop up one at a time. There we go. Each of these the individual values of person center planning represent what we hope to be the outcome of person center planning. So the first thing at the top, the red box there says presume competence. That means that we want to presume that people can make decisions and and have great abilities and to to respect that through person center planning. The other pieces on the in the green box there says that we need to honor the individual's choices, strengths and preferences. It's about that person's wants, their their preferred um, way of life and the things that are building on the things that they're really good at. And the purple box there says everyone can contribute, and this is a really important part of um, person center planning. Um, for too long, we've assumed that people with disabilities are being helped, and while they might be helped through supports and services or you know, having some connection with um, somebody giving them some assistance, if it's direct assistance or the support from the system, but they also contribute, they can contribute something to the community. Um, part of being part of a community is that you're giving back and everybody has something to give to their community. That might be a talent, that might be um, just as a contributor, you know, being an everyday good citizen, good neighbor, it might mean something very specific through contributions, um, work, volunteerism, even voting. We all contribute in different ways and it's making sure that we're we're valuing that person and helping them to find what they can they can bring valuable to their community and helping them to use that. Can I can I just interject one thing about that, that kind Please. of contribution? So I want to just underscore how very important that was. You may recall that I said when I started my career, I was working in group homes where people were coming out of institutions. And in those institutional settings, people really didn't have that opportunity to contribute to the greater whole, right? They were always the one being served, being helped, being supported, being treated, mostly being treated, I think was the way they spoke of it back in those days, right? And I can remember um, people that I, um, grow to to know and become friends with actually that as they came out of those institutions and they began to um, not only be given opportunity to contribute but also there was an expectation that they would right it was transformative for them it people got healthier people's blood pressure went down and they no longer had to take blood pressure medicine people who had you know behavioral challenges like they used to refer to them back in the olden days uh, my sister Mary being one of them, um, suddenly 
that all went away and um, people became happier, um, their well-being improved. And so you can't, um, you can't like think about contribution enough. As human beings, we want purpose and meaning, right? And, and part of how we express our purpose and meaning is by contributing. So I just wanted to say that. Absolutely. And Jane, I think the other part is that when people contribute, if you're a giver, you're seen as you bring that elevates your value to the community, too. And when people are always taking, they're seen as somebody that's subtracting. So when you're giving, you're adding to a community and people have higher value on that community at large does. And where giving and taking happen is where relationships develop. So we have to make sure that people are just part of their community and contributors. And um, as Jan said, there is a health benefit to being a part of uh, the, the contribution um, to your community. So in the blue box, we talk about maximizing independence, creating community connections. I want to be really clear about when we're talking about independence, we're really talking about interdependence. We're not talking to you have to do it by yourself. Nobody does anything their whole life all by themselves. We all rely on somebody at some point for something. In a given day, I bet if you woke up in the non-pandemic world and you were out doing things all day long, you probably relied on a lot of people. And you, we do it as, as we go through our day, we don't even think about it, but we really are making sure that um, when people are part of their community and they're, they're thinking about how they're gonna be planning their life, they wanna be thinking about how they're going to be maximizing those opportunities to connect with others and also build connections with others. Um, I mentioned this earlier, um, person-centered planning has really important to, to focus on one's individual um, and family culture. It's really important. Um, I know in my own family, um, I for my own family member, there was a lot of discussion when we we've done her planning um, at times and we've had discussion from the circle and I knew a new member had come into her circle and somebody said, well, gosh, she's got a lot going on and she's too busy and blah, blah, blah. And it took that circle member a long time to understand that's our family culture, that doing a lot is expected. And um, so that is not, uh, you know, I hate this is the diagnostic where they would use this in a, in a diagnostic setting for people with disabilities. They're over-programmed. And I would hear that and I think, well, I don't really know what that means because in my personal family culture, there's no such thing. If you've got time in the day, you do more. So it's always important to understand that you can um, figure out where somebody's culture fits into their planning process. So next slide. So what do we focus on in planning process? Remember, it's about the individual person. So it could include all some, a couple of these, it's, it's really depends on the individual. So the person could set the agenda and it could include them talking about their personal relationships, how they spend, um, what their house, their home life looks like, um, how their finances are going, good, bad, and indifferent. Um, do they want to maybe start a new career or um, go back to school for a new career? Um, how are they going to volunteer? Maybe they're going to pursue some education. I know Amy mentioned that she in the past had pursued um, community college classes at OCC. So thinking about that, so it's it could include some um, pursuit of higher education. For some people, it might be talking about legal issues. Um, for others, it might include talking about personal safety or health and safety. But most importantly, I always think we forget this, is we need to also make sure that we're including some discussions of fun. And I, we need to have, have people include in their planning process how they're going to build some fun in their life. It's not about going through and creating a task list. That's not what person-centered planning is about. It's about helping people think about the issues that they want to talk about and make sure we're also acknowledging the things that they don't want to talk about. That's not part of planning. That can happen outside of planning. But then also, how do we help that person have some fun so that they're not just going through life and just you know ticking off a, a series of boxes, but really that they're engaged in, in building a life that looks more meaningful to them. Next slide. So isn't, as we talked about in Michigan, um, we have person-centered planning in our 
rules that say if you behavioral health supports that you are to plan for those supports using a person-centered planning process. So no matter who we're working with and if they're receiving supports, these things are all going to happen for everybody. You have a pre-plan where you think about what you want to have on the, the topic lists for your planning process, who's going to be there, when you're going to do it, where's it going to be. Um, it's also important to, to make sure we talk about in the pre-plan before we get to the planning process, what's not going to be talked about. So then some things are going to be off limits. Um, and then we need to maybe think about some accommodations and then who is going to facilitate? Is it going to be the person themselves? Is it their supports coordinator or case manager? Or are you going to maybe engage an independent facilitator? So then you come to the planning process and that's when we talk about what's what does the person identify as their goals and how are we going to go about doing that? And then what supports do we need or services do we need to, to work on those goals? And then who's going to be the people helping you to do that? From there, a plan of service is written, and that's really the agreement between this, this, the community mental health system and the person to say, okay, I'm going to use these supports to help me to get to those goals. And as Amy shared in her um, experience, she's got some very specific things she wants to, and I'm not, I'm kind of just jet over reiterating what Amy said. These might not her, be her specific goals, but she wants to work to earn some money to be able to save to potentially purchase a future car. And that's really laying out there, you know, kind of some process of how things will happen. And um, all the details don't need to be right in the person center, you know, in the plan of service, but in the person center plan, that kind of big picture is written down and then the services and supports kind of fall underneath that. Jane, did you want to add anything to that that I may have missed, Jen? Sorry. Uh, no, I think I think that that's really good. I think one of the things that I'm just going to say, because um, we haven't quite said it yet, um, is that this is really, again, the person's vision, right? So, you know, I might be someone's best friend and be at their meeting, or I might be my son's mother and be at his meeting. Um, and it's not about my vision or what I think would be a good idea, but what my son wants or my friend wants. And so I think those of us who get invited to be a part of the process, not just do we want to look at like family culture and, and, and a person's cultural needs, but we also want to make sure we're not putting up dreams for the person on them. And, and we think about, um, to, to, pick, to just build on Jan's point there, when we think about um, where that fits in with the guardianship relationship, is that again, in, in, in the mental health code, it does not say guardianship planning, it says person-centered planning. So it's really, really important the system still says, even if you have a guardian or a legal person there, the planning process is still at your directive and um, really is the goal, the, the, the role of that guardian to help you go forward and plan um, to work on that plan of process that you want, that vision. Uh, next slide, please. So in the planning process, um, we talked about kind of the, the, the three big steps that are part of it, pre-planning, planning, and the plan of services, the outcome of it. There's also some things that kind of happen in a sequence naturally within the planning process, person-centered planning process. You bring together the people that care about you, and that can be an informal or formal circle of support. You kind of talk about what's happened in the past. Um, I always say don't dwell on the past, it's just there to inform what you're talking about today. And then you talk about today, and then you think about the person's interests and their strengths, the things that they're good at, the things that they like, the things that they're known for that you know make them who they are um, and then helping the person you know the person expresses what they want that vision for their future from there we develop an action plan and then we implement the plan and the plan of service is done is created to implement that plan so this is true for for all the people that we support we don't sometimes think about it this way but really no matter what tool of person center planning you use what style of planning you use all these are elements of good person-centered planning. Next slide. In, in developing a person-centered plan, there's other things that can come out of it. I mean, we're, we're talking about some really important things that, you know, um, can be, you know, realized as an outcome of the planning process. So you might build a stronger circle of support for a person. Obviously, plan of service might come out if they're receiving mental health services. Um, you might develop an emergency backup plan for people if they need that. Um, they might, whoops, I'm getting an echo. 
Is that me or? Uh, okay. I'm going to, Amy, I'm going to mute you. Uh, she muted herself. Okay, thanks. Okay. A little feedback. Thank you. Is that better now? Yep. Okay. And so another thing is some people might have some really uh, fragile medical needs that they want to address and they might have a particular, you know, design response to do that. For some young people or people that are still in school, what we talk about in person-centered planning could be supportive, helpful to what we discuss in a person's individualized education plan. So those two things should not happen in silos, though I do live in the real world and I know that they often do, but we need to use person-centered planning to really inform um, education plans as well. And for some people that are in that transition age, it might also mean that they're helping them develop um, some contributions or content that will go into their transition plan. Next slide, please. So um, a friend of mine developed this several years ago, and I think it's a really helpful kind of way to figure out, is this a real plan or is this a paper plan? Paper plans are those things that sit in the file cabinet that nobody looks at, except when they're come due on some date that's put on the piece of paper. And, and mostly those paper plans are driven by a program and include a lot of formal supports, um, it's about filing a document and from year to year we see little change. It's very structured by that plan, that paper, the planning process. When we talk about a real plan, the person is setting the agenda. They're choosing who's going to be there and how they're going to work towards their, their goal of what they want to achieve and how that team that they bring, brought together is, is helping them to, to work towards that vision. And then through that, we make sure we have outcomes that are measurable, that we can see change over time, and then we have to celebrate. Um, so much of what we do, we do, and we don't celebrate, and it really can be a discourager. So we need to really also celebrate when we have a win. Um, and the other thing is that, and I know this is gonna be a shock to some people, but I've looked at a lot of person server plans in my work role. And one thing that is always a real quick look for me when I look at a person centered plan is if I see somebody else's name in that plan. So it's about one person at a time. So it's always a quality check to make sure it's about one person, their vision, what they want. And all documentation that comes with it should be about that one person, not about that program that they are connected to or that are receiving supports from, but really about that person. Next slide, please. So I do want to just make a couple quick notes so you can think about how this happens in your life and then the people that you might support or care about is at minimum planning needs to occur at minimum once a year. I think in this last 14, 15 months of our lives, we've come to realize that people may have had to have more than one plan because life has been pretty chaotic and we've had people have had a lot of changes in their life. So as things change, um, that are significant, it's important to probably reconvene a planning process. And for that doesn't mean like every day of the week, every week of the month. That means like when there's significant changes, um, and I expect a lot of people have had some pretty significant things happen to them the past several months, year. So we've probably had people need person center plenty more. Um, maybe more than once in the past year because of the circumstances of just life right around, right around now. The other thing I want to support is that people can choose an independent facilitator. That's a person chosen by the person who is receiving the planning, who is the focused person of the planning, to have somebody facilitate on their behalf. There's a variety of reasons to do that, and I'm going to put in the chat box a webinar that, that my organization is doing in, a, in several weeks um, specifically on independent facilitation, what is it, why do it, how to find an independent facilitator, and we'll share that. Um, but the other thing to also think about is when you're doing planning is there are tools that can help you with planning. And it doesn't have to just be like, let's just do the same questions we did over time. Like we, there are some real tools that can help people plan more effectively. You know, they're, they're, they, they can, it, it can be more engaging than just a set of questions. And we want to make sure that that is the case because we want it to be successful for all individuals. Um, bringing up quality for of person center planning for one individual really brings it up for all the system. We'll do better by more people. Next slide. 
Um, I did mention independent facilitation is a part of, of person-centered planning, and there are independent facilitators available to people that receive services from community mental health. It's a paid service, so that means the person's supports from community mental health can pay for that person to help them facilitate. And again, it's chosen by the person. Another way to really raise the bar and person making some decisions about their life. Uh, next slide. Here is, if you're not familiar with how to find an independent facilitator, um, our organization in um, the Arc of Midland have been working together. Um, Jan's trained several independent facilitators over her career. Um, what we've heard from people is that they don't know how to find an independent facilitator. So um, my organization, uh, the Michigan Developmental Disabilities Institute, created a map and we have people trained and you can click on our link and you can find a listing of people available. There are a lot of people available in Oakland and I know there's some people on in Wayne County in here um, as well. And um, they have a bio biography at the website that gives you a little bit of information and we encourage you to, to think about that. What we, what we really wanna discourage is that people are like, somebody calls them up at your case manager and sports coordinator and they say, hey, do you want an independent facilitator? And then suddenly you're supposed to know on the spot. I don't make decisions that way. So having this conversation with people and thinking about it well in advance of when they're gonna convene their planning process is really, really important because I'm a person who likes to think about things and I need to kind of, so if I was looking for an independent facilitator or at least thinking about the idea, I'd wanna walk through the, the biographies and that might take more than a little bit of time than answering that question quickly in the pre-planning process. Uh, next slide. So if you choose to have an independent facilitator, talk to your sports coordinator. If you wanna just learn more about it, talk to your sports coordinator or case manager. And then um, you can have the, you know, tell your sports coordinator or case manager who you picked and they can help you set that up so that the person is there to facilitate you with the pre-plan and the planning process. Next slide. So uh, just a few more things about independent facilitation is that it, it's about helping you think about how you wanna have a good quality planning process. Um, you should expect this a really quality outcome with, with independent facilitation. It's the same thing. It's just that you're deciding, again, decision-making, that you're choosing to have somebody facilitate that on with you or on your behalf. Um, and what we hear from supports coordinators and case managers is they really love it because they get to be a participant too. They know the person, they know a lot about the person and often feel like they're doing a lot of paperwork at a, at a planning process and not really feeling like they're, um, they're there to contribute and this gives them an opportunity to really um, be engaged. And so it's also important um, to know that it's a Medicaid covered service. Angela, we have a, yes. a couple comments in the chat. Oh, please. Yep, go right First, ahead, Mary. Um, Caitlin, I think you just typed in, uh, we've had the question of will the slides be made available? So the uh, presentation is being recorded and the recordings are housed in at the Oakland County Training Units uh, website. So you can go back and see the slides again there. And then comment from Liz Bauer, ideally people who use education, CMH and rehab services would have only one plan that is informed by all areas of interest and involvement of representatives from all areas. Maybe progress has been made, but back in the day, I would tend to a I would attend a person center planning session for Ginny's IEP. Whoop, hang on. The chat just moved on me, so I lost what I was in the middle of reading up. Um, I would attend a person center planning session for Ginny's IEP rehab plan and CMH services, three meetings, all the same people at each meeting, and I had to coordinate all the documents so that we did not have competing goals and methods. Example, school was teaching one sign for Apple and CMH was teaching a different sign for the same thing. I would have been, it would have been nice to have just one 30 page document rather than three, rather than three of the same length. <coughs> Yes, <laughs> Liz, I share your frustration and I I, I agree. Um, I hope that um, I know in my own family's experience that um, has gotten better. 
Um, and I would say um, more recently, even for my own family member, um, the coordination between Michigan Rehab and Community Mental Health, she's no longer receiving school services, but um, working together and they're all in the same meeting. And again, I know um, that coordination is so critical. You know, the systems also have to kind of take ownership of, or they're, you know, accept their part in making sure that we're not duplicating efforts. And that means collaborating and having coordination so that planning processes reflect and feed those other things versus each thing kind of having its own plan and operating and doing something different for the person's life. So I, I hear you. Did I do we get them all, Mary? Um, yes, we Vicki and Caitlin have just put the links oh. in the chat for people where you can find the independent facilitator near you uh, link and then also where these recordings can be reviewed at a later time in the so the slides will be be placed there. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, we'll go to the next slide and we wanted just to, to make sure you are aware um, that the person center policy and practice guideline. This is kind of the tool that helps systems, people that receive supports, etc. Um, know what person center planning and, and how it should be guided is um, comes from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, and that's the statewide agency that um, is you know provides contracts to Oakland Community Health Network and Detroit Wayne Integrated Health Network, other entities. So this really guides what they're supposed to you know, what's expected of person center planning with their services and supports. I just want to make sure people know that it was updated in July 2020. Um, and it, it, again, it focuses on the, it states right in the document and there was an update that really, I think, recenters what person center planning is supposed to be and says that the planning process should focus on the individual, not the system or the individual's family, guardian or friends. Um, it also says that the individual and his or her guardian or authorized uh, representative might request and review the plan of service at any time. And that's again the document that supports the person center plan. So um, next slide. So Jan, I'm going to hand it back to you and, and let you talk about or have you ask if you could touch on our resources and, and kind of some of the next steps for us as we wrap up the presentation part. Jan, right. before you get yes. started, uh, there is another question that just popped up in the chat. Uh, Kristen asks, can you provide information on training opportunities for independent facilitators? Yes, I will put a link in that um, in the in the chat um, with training both on the general awareness training. That's just training about what is independent facilitation and that's for people with disabilities, family members, people that work in the field. We also have a training that the ARC Midland is going to host um, in August to prepare independent facilitators. Um, and just so people are aware, we're still doing all virtual training, but I will put that link in the chat box um, and hand it to Jan. Thank you. Thank you. And I definitely encourage everyone to, um, if you can, attend the one hour training um, that Angela is going to put in the chat about that goes in a little bit deeper about what independent facilitation is and how it can really help you in your person centered planning process. Um, and then if there are people on here who are interested in becoming independent facilitators and you don't work for um, a system, you know, you don't work for a CMH rather, um, or a provider, that would be awesome too, because we always want to have, you know, more people available to, to do this work. But I want to talk a little bit about or just share with you um, a few resources. Um, and these are resources that you can um, look at as relates to both person center planning and other areas of supported decision making, which is, first of all, um, you can contact a local ARC chapter. We have an ARC Michigan that you could also contact, but um, many communities also have a local chapter. And if you click on the, if you go to the web, the ARC Michigan's website, they have, a, they have like a map you can click on that shows you where all of the local chapters are located. Also, um, the Michigan Alliance for Families, particularly for families um, who still have a, a student in school, um, you can contact them as well for some resources. You know, one of the places where we see guardianship encouraged still is often in schools where, um, where school personnel have not been trained in alternatives, right? And so they don't know that there are other ways to help their a pr their student who's approaching the age of 18 get get the um, representation they need they might need so 
Um, the Michigan Alliance for Families is an organization that is very helpful, both in terms of teaching about other ways that you can support a student in school, but also um, connecting you to resources for person-centered planning. And then of course, the Michigan Developmental Disabilities Council, um, which Mary is an employee, um, also has a breadth of resources available related to, um, again, both, well, all three, person-centered planning, uh, independent facilitation of said planning, and also alternatives to guardianship and supported decision-making. So those are three really great resources that you can um, check into if you want either more, just more um, information, or if you actually need some help accessing something. Next slide, please. And so again, just to kind of reiterate, we can't say this enough. Um, really, if we have the same high expectations for citizens who have developmental disabilities that we do for other citizens. You know, as a mom, I had the same expectations for my youngest son, Tim, who happens to have autism, as I um, do for my son, Justin, who does not have that label placed on him. Um, and so, you know, they, they, have, they both have wonderful life trajectories that are very different because they have very different interests, but the expectations um, are the same, right? That we also presume competence. You know, I, I um, Amy, you kept saying, you know, that people were shocked. The people shouldn't have been shocked. People should have expected that you would know how to do things and that you would be able to make decisions, right? Um, so we've got to get rid of that notion that it's shocking when a person who happens to have a label of a developmental disability is able to do things. Let's presume competence. And then um, if we just really as we're, you know, as we engage with other people, really help people understand that there are, um, that really the focus should be on supported decision making. And if there is a guardianship, that it's the least restrictive guardianship option. And I know, I think Elizabeth, you said earlier that lots of judges don't like to do um, guardianships that are less than a full plenary guardianship, right? They they often don't like to do partial guardianships or or just a guardian of a state versus a guardian of person and a state. But really, we all need to advocate for whatever is the least restrictive guardianship option if there is a guardianship being considered. And then we just want to continue to advocate and be informed and collaborate. And I think I heard somebody sigh like they wanted to say something. There is a question or a comment in the chat. Uh, Joyce writes, in my experience, folks are not aware of where to go for supported supporting documents like POA, et cetera, uh, they may, that may be needed as alternatives to guardianship. Many of them cannot afford attorney fees. Any suggestions? Yes, in fact, I do. All three of those organizations um, have some of those materials that you're talking about. Um, also, the um, supported decision-making work, are we a work group? I'm not sure what we are. Um, advisory group, group. Advisory group, thank you, <laughs> is working on a toolkit that would be accessible um, to anyone um, that would, would have many of those tools that you're talking about. But in the meantime, because we're not quite done with it, um, I know that if you were to go to the ARC Michigan's website, they do have um, a, a packet or a, it's a booklet, I guess you could say, that has some PO, different kinds of sample power of attorney forms, some patient advocate kinds of documents. So there's, if you go to the three, um, entities that I um, mentioned, you can get some of that stuff in the meantime, but we are we are well on our way to this toolkit. We've been we've done a lot of work and we're getting close. So and it's really important. Joyce brings up a good point is that a paper should not be a reason people have to go to the extreme of a guardianship. So we we fully recognize that the toolkit has is so it's it's going to be a real game changer for a lot of people because it's been kind of I don't want to say the the reason, but certainly sometimes the cause of why people have been led to guardianship. And I don't want any lawyers to get mad at me. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not a lawyer and I don't play one. I, I just I have a lot of lovely lawyer friends and they serve a good purpose. But we know that that lack of documentation has been some of the has led people down a, a really dark path of guardianship sometimes. And, and what I was going to say about the not getting lawyers mad, I will tell you that both my sister and my son have documents in place, powers of attorneys, 
forms that we took from the ARC Michigan. And so we didn't pay a lawyer to help us do it. Right. And my sister is in her 60s and um, has been guardian for for several decades and we have never had a problem she's very she's we go to the doctor a lot we've never had a problem at the doctor we've never had a problem with her being able to sign contracts for like you know when she got her cell phone plan and things like that so okay this is mary Next. um i'm just going to drop in the chat my email as well um i as angela pointed out i work for the michigan developmental disabilities council and so if you contact me and want particular resources in your area um, we do try to keep sort of a running list of lawyers in, in different areas of the state that um, are helpful in these matters. Thank you. And if I could just add on behalf of the work group, if you run into issues of things that you discover along your own personal path, um, the work group would like to hear that because I think it also will help us to inform what's next, what's needed next, right? We're working, yep. this toolkit, as Jan said, they're working on the education group team of our work group is working hard to have this kind of be a first step, but we recognize that people are going to have maybe encounter new things that we haven't thought of. And so giving that feedback um, it, through Mary would be really helpful to us as kind of a feedback loop. So I think at this point, we're going to open it up to questions Bye. and um, comments and, and really just let the, let the audience um, Give us their thoughts. Hello. Yes. I have a question. I'm okay. using my cell phone at the moment. Um, I'm a parent of an adult with autism spectrum disorder. She lives with me. Uh, almost four years ago, I purchased a condominium townhouse style and um, she still lives with me. Um, there are only two bedrooms. Um, I made it clear, even in writing, that my Asian culture and most especially my family cult culture uh, do not believe in group homes or nursing homes. That's really spelled out even in writing. Now, I come to a point wherein, okay, I purchased this condominium townhouse and um, it's a two bedrooms and our association uh, does not allow, if something happens to me, so there will be a spare room. Um, our association does not allow just because you own this unit that you will have a renter. Mm -hmm. um, whether that is a fact, you know, um, my daughter, um, has severe challenging behavior issues. She's not aggressive, but it's really challenging. Um, she did not grow up in a large family. She's an only child and I'm divorced, but we have a very good relationship. He tries to see Joyce on a monthly basis and it became inconsistent because of the pandemic. Uh, my point is, I had addressed this to a parent advocate in one of the, um, I don't want to say the organization, um, let's say in one of the agencies here in Oakland County, well respected that um, my daughter requires a 24 seven care. And actually it is written on my daughter's uh, PCP. Um, and she did not grow in was not raised in a large family. I have only two bedrooms and with the association regulations. I was told that um, my daughter's provider agency, whom I'm not going to mention, um, wants and requires three. Three, three uh, persons that they serve in, in a house. And I disagree with that because um, this is a private, this is not like a group home setting. Can anybody enlighten me on that, on that, please? So I'm going to start and then Jan, uh, I want to get your thoughts. So let me step back to one part of the, so the, the sharing of uh, a housing arrangement. I think for anybody, if a person, what we always have to, to figure out for a person is, can I 
you know, for my own self, I'm, you know, what do I need to do to in order to make it possible for me to live in my house, right? And we think about, you know, what supports you might need, um, affordability, practicalities, those types of things. And so we have to always ask those questions for each of us individually. And for some of us, it might mean that we need to bring in support, right? Um, and the question being that how do we make those arrangements? So, you know, for some people, and um, and I know Jan can also speak to this because she has a family member who kind of had to make these kind of decisions that sometimes if you want to live on your own or because of your the parameters of your housing situation, want to live on your own, you might not have support all the time because it might not meet you know being necessary for your needs and so you might bring in al alternative supports and that might be remote support it might be a neighbor it could be a lot of different things but it's i hear it's really important in that person center plan what i heard you say in the very beginning of your thought and forgive me if i missed any of the words that you said i was having a little bit of trouble hearing it was a little bit difficult but i heard you say culturally it's not our family does not believe in people living in group homes or nursing homes. And I, I I get that. And so something that that would be, creating that would be counter to your daughter's wishes and wants and needs and it would not reflect your family's goals. And I get that. So that should be kind of the, the first piece of it, filling in where the supports and what's possible in the current housing situation that talks some takes some individual discussions about this, the services and again um, providers making kind of blanket decisions uh, or rules about what's a minimum in order for us to do something is not really relevant to person center planning and so it's about focusing on the person and figuring out how those supports can be arranged to make that individual plan work. Jan, um, I know you have some thoughts there, so I'm going to pass it to you. Well, I, 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 you know, I never like to hear when providers are dictating or CMHs or anyone is dictating who gets to live with who or who should live with who or how many people need to live together. So, you know, I always that always causes me to bristle a little bit if people are being told that. I do think that it's very important that you have things in writing and that you through throughout the person center planning process and in any documents or any time you're you know working with the, the folks in the system that they understand what it is that you that you desire for your for is it you said your daughter right for your daughter um the other thing though that i that you did mention is the cultural piece and it's not just about your family culture this is about your your asian culture and that needs to be honored and respected as well. I mean, that's we we have to as a system, we have to do that. And so I think it's really important too that you make sure that the circle, the people that are supporting your daughter really understand um, your family culture, but also the broader cultural implications of of even talking about your daughter living in um, something other than, you know, her family home, right? Um, with whatever support that she needs. So when I think about your situation, I think that it really speaks to making sure that your person-centered plan um, that addresses those issues, that any other kinds of documents you have, like powers of attorney or your, your family estate plan also addresses those issues, and that you find, you know, the kind of advocacy that you need that also understands those issues to help you to assure that those wishes are going to be honored. I know they can be because I have a sister who lives a mile away from me all by herself and she needs lots and lots of support. Um, and I will also want to say one thing though, because I want 24 hour seven, okay. what I believe is not always what's possible too, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody has individual needs. Right. Um, I would love to have somebody live with me and make my days perfect, but I don't need that, right? But every person is different. And the other thing is that it doesn't always have to be with a hands-on support. I also wanna make sure that we're clear that there are other ways beyond people. For some people, that's not completely necessary, right? Um, and, you know, I'm just gonna put this out there as a mom. I know moms don't wanna hear this, but sometimes, their kids will do things differently when they're not there 
and they're doing just fine too. So um, your kids can surprise you. Again, it goes back to the presuming competence. Excuse me, I need to correct you, please. Uh, my daughter requires 24-7 care. She does not have physical disability, but she has challenging behavior issues. She does not understand safety. She does not know about uh, functional daily living skills. And um, my point is, yes, we have budget issues. Why would a particular provider just require the person that they serve be with three persons in a housing? Um, that's wrong. Because I had asked another advocate in another agency, and I was told specifically face to face, that's wrong. And she told me that she can review further the Medicaid guidelines. And it bothers me because I know a case wherein the parent had left a letter of intent. Um, they have a house, uh, about three bedrooms, and the parent had instructed the successor trustee, who's an agency, uh, to sell the house and just buy a small condominium. Uh, that did not happen. What so, did agency do? What did agency do? Is recruit two more persons with disability and stay in that home. So okay, what bothers me you, is I that the to... letter of content is okay. not followed strictly, and that everything <laughs> is equated into budget issues. Okay, so I'm going to stop you. I, I'm, I'm going to stop you only in the interest of time, and I want to be able to address what you just said for everyone, and, and kind of bring it br bring it back out so that broadly. it applies to everyone, right? Yep. More broadly, and that is this. One of the things that I, and we're going to talk more about circles at the June training, but one of the things that I have always said from, for people who know me know I've been saying it for 30 years, that it is very important that when you are assembling your circle of support, when you know you're a mom and you know that your child is going to outlive you, that you are creating a multi-generational circle so that you have people that's not necessarily an agency, although it could be if you've build a trusting relationship with that agency, but that you have people that you know are gonna to continue to carry out those wishes, right? Um, because the truth of it is, when I'm gone, I assume I'm gonna be gone before my sister, even though she's older than me. Um, but when I'm gone, you know, I can't make sure that stuff happens the way she needs it to. But luckily for her, my son can make sure of that. And if, if you know, if, she go, lives a really, really long time, then my grandchildren will grow up and make sure that that, that happens for her, right? And so I wanna just say that um, person-centered planning and even guardianship, right? All of those tools to help make sure that people get what they need are only as good as they are as as they are in the moment that they're happening, right? You also have to build those relationships and people in your lives that are gonna be there for the long haul. And so my best advice to families that worry about what will happen after they're gone is to make sure you're creating a multi-generational circle so that you have people that are going that love the person and are gonna support and champion the person after you're gone. I feel like Amy, are you still on Amy? I feel like that's what the fire chief is for you, right? You know, when your mom was gone, he stepped right in. Am I right? He sure is. Yep, he sure is. And so you know, you don't have to worry because you've got somebody, you know, mom's gone and so she can't be your champion anymore, but you've got a champion, right? Yeah. Yep. And those relationships are really important because the, the, the champions beget more champions. And so what a real circle should do, and that's why Jen uh, mentioned the multi-generational piece, is that they bring in more people that are new connections that the person wouldn't otherwise have. And that's really uh, an essential role of a good solid circle. And I know we're coming up on time. If there's maybe a chance for one more comment or question, uh, I, but we really, I mean, Amy, Jan, and I really do appreciate people um, sharing their thoughts and putting their questions out there because it, it was really important. We, I think, was, is there any other final questions that, uh, Mary, I can't see the thing. The there's chat. nothing else in the chat at this time. I'll just make a quick comment that, yep. um, you know, for the woman who asked the last question, 
it's definitely um, a longer conversation and really starting with the people who are living there, your daughter, it sounded like you had maybe two daughters living there, doing like a 168 hour calendar, what are the supports they need, 24 hours a day, seven days a week for an entire week, and then figuring out where you already have supports built in and where you need supports and then working with that. And, and that may even include, you know, going to the, uh, it sounded like maybe a homeowners association and talking about an accommodation of having maybe some live-in support that, you know, is in that third bedroom or whatever. So again, it's really just an idea of bringing the group together and having a longer conversation to work out those specific details. So I know we're almost, thanks, thanks, Mary. I'm going to, we're going to pass it back to, to Vicki and Caitlin to give us some Conclusion instructions, because I know there's some final steps people have to do as being participants. So, so okay. thank you. We did have one final question that just came in the chat. When do you typically make a person centered plan and can you still do one if the individual has a guardian already? You, you absolutely, absolutely can still do one if the person has a guardian. And in fact, person centered planning is the law for any person receiving um, system support, you know, CMH behavioral health supports, whether they have a guardian or not. Um, so yes, you can do one and you can do it at any time, right? Um, I think if you're working together with a CMH, they'll tell you it has to happen every, I don't know, 365 days, but it can happen more frequently than that. And it can happen whenever the person wants to start bringing people together to engage in a planning process. Right. So just a reminder for folks that if you uh, need social work CEUs, Caitlin is going to be putting the uh, survey into the link uh, into the chat i'm sorry we do need you to complete that survey if you do want the social work ceu for this training um, and then anybody else who's participate could if you complete the training that helps us with our future planning as well and let's go to our next slide and so we do have future sessions as we mentioned in june we're doing uh identifying circles of support which is really important especially you know, as Joyce was talking about, um, you know, it's her and her daughter. So thinking about how do you uh, create this other this circle of support for your loved one as as you get older and, and move on from life. And then in July, we're going to also be talking about life course tools that you can use to, to do supported decision making. August is about assistive technology that to help people live inclusively and independently. Uh, September is going to be talking about healthy relationships. Um, maybe a little sex talk in there. <laughs> October is going to be uh, about uh, peers, how peer mentors can help with supported decision making. I'd make that joke about September because sometimes people just don't don't realize that we all have a uh, need for relationships and and uh, you know desires like anybody else. And so sometimes that topic is not discussed because it's a difficult topic for people to discuss sometimes. So I like to just lighten it up a little bit. <laughs> All right, next slide. And where to find our recordings. Again, if you go to our website at oaklandchn.org and you uh, click training and then recorded trainings, we do have all the past ones posted. It'll be about a week or so before this one is posted. And uh, please share those with other individuals. Um, and you can view those other ones. They are a, an hour and a half, just like this training. All right, next slide. Thanks again for attending the training. We really appreciate our trainers, Angela and Jan and Anna Marie and Amy. Thank you so much. That was excellent. I appreciate your passion and your uh, support of individuals. So thanks again. And uh, that does conclude our training and we'll hang out for a few minutes if people uh, have any questions or uh, if you have any difficulty getting into the survey. Last comment in the chat box. Awesome training and a big thanks to Amy for sharing your story with us. Very helpful and good to know. And again, we'll be repeating this at six this evening. If you know somebody who would benefit from uh, joining us in the